Welcome to Virtual Thoughts, episode number seven, I believe, and we're here with Kevin Goodman, the CEO of FS Logics, who just joined um, TVP as a sponsor. Thank you for that, Kevin. What does that, give us a brief description of FS Logics, and we can go from there. So sure, FS Logics is a startup that uh, we're tell, hoping to redefine um, how you handle your applications and your user data in Windows, whether it's physical, virtual, Zen app, Zen desktop, View, Microsoft, we don't care. We're taking advantage of a bunch of new technologies, changes that have taken place to make it easier on you just to get the data to your users and the applications to their users without having to have a lot of people and labor um, necessary to do it. So. At the virtualization practice, we generally drink our own champagne, so we talk about virtual desktops an awful lot. So we run a virtual desktop environment. Our biggest pain point is basically mapping users to hosts, to the desktops, without having a huge amount of disk space allocated just for them and managing the personas, the people, the users, so that they can go to any desktop they want. So we don't have to keep on having like, oh, that's your desktop. Nope, that's my desktop. You don't want that. No, you don't. And because it, it, there's a bunch of underlying problems that uh, that happens when you do that. When you tie a user to a particular desktop, then that that user, as you say, can't roam. I mean, this has been a problem that we've been trying to solve for years now. Um, and the, the, the whole roaming, the whole roaming profile bit that's always been messed up on Windows. Yeah, so you know, I you know Microsoft is a victim of their own success. The, the the product Windows is fantastic, but look what happened. We expanded on it. We we became mobile. We want to go from this office to that office, and we want to see our same pictures of the the kids on the wallpaper and get access to our same documents. And and uh, there have been a lot of third party and a lot of really smart people that have uh, you know, come up with ways to try to fix this problem. And FS Logics is just a, a new entry in that category here. Um, and the reason we exist is because there's been some changes in technology uh, with respect to how we handle disk space now, how we, um, how we uh, uh, use virtual desktops and how we access that data, as, as well as how we access our applications. And it, that's the interesting thing is that also based on what the user is, where the user is, they may or may not be able to access an application. So if I'm at a remote office, being a, a remote customer office, being able to access the accounting data, for example, may not be a good thing. But um, if I'm in my office accessing the accounting data should be something I should be able to do as a company owner. You know, location-based awareness is, is is very very important, especially as you mentioned in where you have um, you know sensitive data. Uh, U.S. healthcare uh, laws prohibit anyone from a doctor viewing health uh, patient records anywhere except on premises. So, uh, with that uh, you know thought in mind. You don't want to make criminals out of a nurse who disconnects from her desktop, goes home, reconnects to check some email. She doesn't want to view patient data. She, uh, you know, she doesn't want to do it on purpose. But that is a violation of a law. So you have to take those types of things into account. But even that, you know, if you think that that's just an outlier compared to, I just really want the illusion of a persistent desktop, regardless of what IT wants. IT would like us to get to a non-persistent desktop because it's the cheapest way to yes. update it. But the user wants the illusion of persistence. I want to leave the desktop and find it the way I left it when I come back. And whatever you can do to accommodate that is fantastic. Second to that is, though, and both IT and the user want this, is productivity. If you're spending too much time to log on, we did some studies at my last company that found after you know, a 30 second log on, you get distracted. It's only human nature. <laughs> 30 seconds, if it was my kids, it'd be more like two seconds. Yeah, they, and as newer and newer kids come into the workplace, that, you know, instant on is gonna be necessary to keep their, but what happens to all of us, right? Uh, we get distracted. Maybe I, for, for me, I'll probably go get a cup of coffee. 
you know it doesn't take 30 seconds to get coffee. It takes two minutes or five minutes. Then you get stuck in the hallway conversation. And then next thing you know, you've blown 20 minutes of the company's time all because your login took too long. Those types yeah. of things are expensive. It, it, well, and it is, and it leads to a lot. Distractions are always expensive because usually on average, they, um, when I worked at digital, they did a whole bunch of studies on this. And IBM did the same studies, and they basically came up for every distraction. It usually takes about 15 minutes to get back to work. I, you know what, I, I believe that. I believe that. The other part about that too is when you're in the middle of working, those distractions also become very frustrating because you lose your train of thought. Um, and you know, if you're working, the last thing we want to do is derail that in IT. But for when you click on an Excel spreadsheet. And because of stuff that's un, you know, has nothing to do with you, IT infrastructure has caused it two, three minutes to open that document. That's actually worse than taking two minutes to log in. Well, and I agree with you. And that's where things like being able to actually map volumes or map applications to specific things so that the applications are always there for when they need them to be, but they're not actually part of the desktop golden image, let's say. That becomes a really interesting story is because if you can get those mapped early and running, that becomes a much better way to deploy the application. Yeah, well, so it's a it's a balancing act, isn't it? So IT, the st staff's budgets have been cut, but they've been asked to do more. Back when I was in IT, it was Windows and Windows only. Now it's Windows and mobile and you know and and Macs and all these other things in the organization. You don't yes. have a lot of time to spend futzing with a user's roaming profile anymore, you know? Well, and, you, and that's the key is you don't. And that's that's with the way that I have. I mean, on my desktop alone, I have one, two, three, four, four, five, four devices, not including this thing. So, you know, <laughs> When you start thinking about what everybody has, a single user has multiple devices. When you start talking about a company, you mean you're talking about thousands upon thousands. And it's, yeah, it's true. And that's why you've seen the, the, the big companies in our organization uh, uh, migrate and try to handle a plan to, to handle mobile and stuff like that. The VMwares and, and the Citrixes and the Microsofts are all including mobile in there in their um, you know, grandiose schemes. I, I personally don't know that I need a corporation to manage my iPhone, honestly. Uh, but then again, I don't have any too, too many corporate apps that I have to manage, but I can see where you know, that becomes a reality. And the one point I think it's interesting making as the more and more cycles you spend handling mobile, more and more cycles you hand handling these other things, the less cycles you want to spend managing your legacy Windows applications, uh, you know. Well, and it's, it's it's funny is that I have a company that I do a lot of work with, um, consulting and otherwise. And they use Windows desktops and MacBooks. Okay, they have both. Everybody, all the top people have both. They use they don't use virtualization all that much. Everybody gets a desktop and they use it and they monitor it six ways a Sunday. But they add people to the company fairly slowly. When they have turnover, it's maybe one or two people every every six months if they have it at all. So in that type of organization, it's fairly easy for a single person to keep up. But if they went to a virtual environment, a virtual desktop, what they would end up doing, and this is what I've seen, is that those environments have just grown. Oh, I can just put up another desktop. I'll just do another desktop. Oh, I got 10,000, I got like six people coming on today. Hey, here's your virtual desktop. It takes three minutes to set that up. Things have gotten shorter. We can do things faster, but if as we do them faster, we're actually lacking the automation to give better control over those environments, I find. Yeah, I've, I mean, what you described is, is going on in, in corporate America a lot with our diverse locations and, you know, these mergers and acquisitions and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things virtual desktops provide you, I, hey, I need to spin up 6,000 desktops for a new division we just acquired. Um, yeah, sure, they probably have their old way of doing it, but we have a corporate standard here, so we want to issue a corporate standard desktop. Uh, imagine how fast you're going to get that up using virtual desktops 
uh, compared to going through the old process of uh, requisitioning physical re hardware and doling it out. Yeah. Or going there and re-imaging. Or going there and re-imaging. Yeah. And then wondering what drivers are the rec drivers for that hardware and is your image going to work and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, so and the, those new organizations have their own apps too. That's why you bought them. You know, they still need access to that, but those apps don't necessarily fit the corporate image. So that's where this other aspect of being able to layer applications on top of that image come into play while managing the identities so that the identities of the users can tie into that. Okay, you got your corporate image. Now you have your applications. You have your users that are interacting. Now I have the specialized applications, and then those users interact with those. That whole layering process is just, that's now a fact of life. It, it it is, and it's it's um, you know, in some ways it's been so difficult. It's been tempted to rip and replace it, the whole entire thing. But what I found that you know, I was in a company that got or acquired. Uh, my company's name was RTO. We had an RTO software domain. Ditto. Two years left when I when I left that organization. We were still on the RTO software domain. That's how long it takes to integrate sometimes. Yep. So you really don't want to rip and replace if you don't have to. Even some of the best companies in the world, in this place, it was one of the best companies in the world that acquired us. I mean, they even took two years to fully assimilate us. So it, you know, it happens. Um, and that's, you know, that's some of the thoughts I took with me when I left and, and started FS Logics with a couple of smart people was the, the fact that rip and replace isn't really going to work. Um, it's never yeah. worked. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you can layer, and this is just a technology, I know we use the term layering to describe a specific set of application and uh, uh, profile virtualization, but if you can just layer your technology onto their existing stuff, you have a really good chance of solving their problems immediately without requiring a big... Um, you know, six to eight week uh, conversion cycle and things like that. But what's then? Then, then you gotta you gotta ask, and people are probably asking this: is what's the real gotcha with doing layering for for applications? Let's say, is there any? Well, there's yeah, yeah there's always going to be uh, you know the people that are designing these applications. So name your big software vendors out <laughs> there. They're not writing this with. Um, your layering, third-party layering application uh, solution in mind. The, most of them were designing the application for, you know, Windows 7, 8, 10. Maybe a few of them go as far out of the way as to do it for RDSH and Citrix. Um, but most of them design it for, for Windows 7. So you're always going to have an outlier application that wasn't meant to be layered. And depending on how you do your layering, you run into situations. Um, you know, we continually see new application virtualization vendors out there because the the original ones, um, you know, my favorites were ThinApp and AppV. Um, don't layer all of the applications. It's just, uh, I mean, it, it's just a fact of life due to their architecture. They don't, you know, applications with drivers don't work work so well for them. Yeah. Um, applications that have to communicate with other applications. Um, you so, get are these, so are these layering technologies, including your own, more, nothing more than just creating a container, putting all the right bits in it, and then saying, okay, you need this other container or this other bits underneath to make it work? Well, if you go back and you realize how why they were created initially, it's always been um, difficult to get the applications to the image itself. It's always been an effort to build that image. And initially, we first started seeing, like Softricity, um, uh, Tim Mangan, who was one of the original guys, Softricity, is on our advisory board. Initially, he'll tell you, we they came up with Softricity because disk space, storage, was prohibitive in, oh, yes, like, is in a metaframe environment. So if you were doing terminal services back then or metaframe, you couldn't build up an image that had all the applications in there. So it, because it just was cost prohibitive, it would be cheaper to give everybody a, a, a big fat honking PC and let them go on their way. Um, but so 
what they did is they came up with really a, a, a really slick solution to wrap a, a bubble around the application, a sequence or package, depending on which mm -hmm. app vendor you use. You sequence or package the application, and you allow it to install at runtime. This runtime installation, if you think about it, um, it requires the illusion of administrative privileges because in this situation, you, you need non-administers to be able to install these applications at runtime. Applications typically take administrative privileges so they can write to program files or let's say HKEY local machine. Oh yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> so, so look at this ingenious method. It intercepts all of those calls. They stay within the package or the bubble as I like to call it. And voila, you have an application delivered at runtime that looks like it was installed. Um, there are there were some caveats at the beginning, uh, and you know, and they keep getting better each and every year. And remember, back in the day, your your executable actually said at the client as opposed to the actual uh, exe name. Um, but um, fast forward to today, and storage isn't expensive anymore. I'm not sure why we're we're we're, we're still clinging on to that fact. You have some storage vendors out there that do this inline file deduplication that make one image that you're putting out there the same amount of storage space as n number of images. And so if you, if you think about that, why are we going through all this effort to install an application at runtime when it doesn't cost any more to install it at build time when you're building the image um a side benefit of that uh, but it but it but it does cost you time and, and we're, we're going to run out of our own time here first in a little bit is uh, i mean it's not costing you store it would cost you a little bit of storage but with deduplication everything like that it makes storage costs and thin thin provisioning makes storage costs go way down and that was great but you got to remember as I roll out 6,000 VMs, each one of those virtual desktops takes up a fair amount of storage onto itself. So I may be pushing the limits of what's allocated and available until I grow it some more. So even though I think it's it's a case of, you know, we still worry about storage because it's the one finite resource we have in our data centers. It's not like I can magically add petabytes. It's true. So, you know, with I just use it better. <laughs> yeah. And so, you're you're describing today and you solve today's problems with today's technology and um you know what fs logics decided is why not store that application into a vhd that everybody can share and then at runtime at that point in time we'll just connect up to it we make a couple of different um uh changes we we do ask you to install it once natively you install it once natively and from there on out we'll uh, have that into the uh, uh, VHD or VHDX, in which all those images can then connect up to it. Uh, one of the things you have to do to get this to work, to be able to scale, is you have to have that VHD install inside the guest, which yep. means no, no different than connecting up a USB drive or something like that. Correct. Um, if you want to use this by, there is another method to use this by uh, doing it at the hypervisor level. That hypervisor level, uh, as of today, is is limited into the number of applications you can uh, install into it. There are some scalability limitations there. But as um, a VHD that I can use anywhere, it looks like a USB drive. It's just like I had an application on a USB drive that I just start running. But you've intercepted all the other things like HKEY local machines, so it's again stuck within the vhd so the the other interesting part about it also is that you now open up physical desktops into the realm Absolutely. and what we're seeing here is there's still a huge migration plate taking place what do we have 10 million corporate windows <laughs> desktops and i that last count is probably higher than that uh, what did I say? 10 million? I meant 100 million. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or almost, you know, 750 million on Windows 7 alone. So, all right, my number's billion. There's a billion Windows desktops, right? So, 750 million Windows 7, the rest are combined between 8 and XP, right? Yeah. H how many virtual desktops do you think we have? Um, at the moment, I probably bet it's in the hundreds of millions. 
So well, that means we still have 800 million to get converted along the way. So but the thing is, is do they need to be converted because everybody has something at their desktop anyways, or they have an iPhone or whatnot? It's, it becomes a question of should they be converted? Should we actually these apps just be using newer technologies and we just get rid of the Windows operating system? These are questions that are going to be ongoing for quite a while. I think at another virtual thoughts, we should talk about those. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's do it. I'll wrap it up with this, though, as uh, with respect to those. I quit the mainframe industry in 1991 because I thought it was dead. Then just recently at a conference, I checked into a hotel and the woman turned the screen around to see if she had spelled my email address right. And they were using a mainframe system to check in guests. <laughs> so here we are in 2015 and we haven't gotten rid of the mainframe yet. So I believe there's a lot of windows um, that, that can be converted if, if, while I'm still uh, uh, working and haven't gone into retirement yet. Absolutely. Well, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us on Virtual Thoughts. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much.